Hello and welcome to the world around us. In this edition, we first go to jail in Rwanda and meet some inmates who are serving sentences without being charged of any crime. Then we catch up with Formula One racing drivers in France and realize that it's not just fun and games. Then we examine the Californian way for reducing the risk of a heart attack. Forget the heart, instead focus on the mind. 60,000 prisoners have been languishing in Rwandan jails for almost two years now. Over 2,000 have died and some more thousands have been crippled. These prisoners haven't been charged of any crime. They're all suspects of genocide. Proving them guilty will take a lot of time and money. On the other hand, those found innocent will have already served their sentence. Or perhaps they may never live to hear that they have been acquitted. These Rwandan men can only guess why they've been in jail for two years. Not one of them has been formally charged. So they've had to assume that they're accused of committing the most heinous crime, genocide. They were rounded up after Rwanda's 100-day civil war when the country's Hutu majority tried to wipe out the Tutsi minority. So far, there's been no justice for these men and women who have languished here at Gitarama prison. Even some babies who were with their mothers when they were arrested are still here two years later. Across Rwanda, 60,000 prisoners have been waiting in jails, and they are the lucky ones. Over the past 15 months, close to 2,500 people have died in these jails from disease. Thousands more have lost legs to infections from being forced to stand for days. Here, more than 6,000 inmates are trying to survive. They sleep only when someone gets up. One bucket of crushed cornmeal and beans a day feeds a few hundred women and children. But now it looks as if their perseverance has paid off. With the call of a name comes a temporary release from these suffocating walls. A breath of fresh air and a ray of hope for the lucky few. These men will at last find out what they've waited so long to know, why they are here. Chief Prosecutor Ferdinand Mabera's job is to make sure these newly trained investigators, known as IPJs, interrogate the accused and gather information so the trial dates can be set. As there was not a justice system, there were just people maintaining the security of the country. These people started arresting masses of people based solely on eyewitness accounts. Makamumbera thinks the investigator is going to tell him he's charged with committing genocide. I don't know if I'm accused of genocide. Last week they called my name, but the file wasn't ready, so this is the first time I will meet with the IPJ. Since Makamumbera is out waiting to meet the investigator, he's missing class. What began as impromptu lessons has evolved into a much needed outlet. While the inmates wait for justice, classes and religious lectures help pass the time. Two years and $19 million later, new courts have been built and judges and investigators trained. But the waiting is still far from over for the accused. If Rwanda wants to build a fair justice system, each case will take a considerable amount of time. Jujen Jiwimana is one of the newly trained investigators. We ask the prisoners questions about the genocide. Because we believe they took part in the genocide of 1994. Investigators will also have to travel to each local village to get testimonies from eyewitnesses. A difficult and slow job since many survivors are afraid to say what they saw. Now, for both the inmates and survivors like Kabutu Evryen, the judicial investigators offer the only hope for answers and justice. From her hiding spot under a pile of leaves, she heard her neighbors murder her five children and nine grandchildren. Now, she wants them to pay 
I am willing to go forward to justice because I am not staying alone. I don't have anyone else to help me, so I don't have a reason to live. I have no children, nothing. Everyan gave testimony to the local IPJ, and now two of the nine accused of murdering her family are here in jail. Sometime in the near future, they too will hear their names called, and finally begin the slow walk to justice. This is Sarah Carter reporting from Gitarama, Rwanda. Mention Formula One racing and the first thought that comes to a viewer's mind is the thrill and perhaps then the spills. For the drivers though, it's not always so exciting. Research has proved that these speed kings are highly stressed and under tremendous physical pressure. If there's a limit to human endurance, it's perhaps here at the racing track. is Formula One racing. Only the fastest cars and the best drivers compete in this arena. To win here, racing teams must keep up with the latest advances in technology. But faster cars mean more stress on the driver. Cars are going faster and faster, so each time that a second is gained in a lap, the driver suffers a little bit more. There's less time to breathe, less time to break, and more effort is required to make the curves. So the human limits are being tested bit by bit. That's what's so interesting. We're researching to see how far we can go. At Maison Lafitte, researchers study the way stress affects Formula One race drivers. It's knowledge that can also be applied to handling stress in everyday life. Researchers have found that when they race, Formula One drivers produce five times the amount of adrenaline they normally do. This puts a lot of stress on their hearts. But doctors say that negotiating a curve or a business deal can have the same effect on the body. Dr. Jacqueline Rambo is in charge of medical care for a large French corporation. Since we realized that our personnel were at cardiovascular risk, we decided to create a cardio training room where we can test and measure their cardiovascular risks. While they exercise, they note the regularity of their heart rate. At the end of the workout, they are checked to see if they have worked in the cardiac range that was determined to be best for them. This man must not exceed 130 to 150 beats per minute. If he exceeds it, his heart is working too fast and they will teach him to work more slowly. Before starting here, I had problems sleeping because things turned in my head. Now, I'm more relaxed. In order to eliminate the work stress, it is also good to come here. We do training for the heart. Formula One drivers are under tremendous physical pressure when they round a curve. Researchers have found that about 10 tons of centrifugal force is being exerted on their heads, and that means they need extra neck support. Driver Jean-Marc Gounan is having the tension in his neck measured. The information researchers gain will be used in Formula One car design and in better headrests for the average driver. On va mesurer l'activité des muscles du cou. We will measure the muscle activity of the neck when the subject is using a headrest and try to see which is the best position so that the subject tires a leaf during a long drive. These electrodes will enable us to record the muscle's electric activity. The researchers who are working on the Formula One are one of the rare teams who work on neck muscles during real driving conditions. The researchers who work on the Formula One are one of the rare teams who work on neck muscles during real driving conditions. 
sur les muscles du cou dans des conditions réelles. It's extreme conditions for the Formula One drivers, but it's also relevant for real driving conditions. It is very important for us. These are the only people with whom we can have an exchange of scientific information that can come from the experiments they carry out. Researchers have also learned a great deal from Formula One racing about the effect of vibrations on the body. Low frequency vibrations affect the back, medium frequency can affect vision, and high frequency can create muscle fatigue. To reduce these effects, a new seat material was developed for Formula One cars by a French firm. Because of its ability to absorb shock, it's now being used in shoes, bike seats, ski bindings, and racket handles. Even when the Formula One season is over, the race for new answers in the laboratory continues. And next season will bring more drivers who will be willing to test the limits of human endurance. More often than not, it's the stress more than anything else that proves fatal for a heart or cancer patient. That's why some doctors feel that it's the mind that could prove the biggest healer of these dreaded diseases. So rather than looking for cures to these diseases, researchers point out that stress reduction can go a long way in helping the patients live a bit longer. And more important, be happier. These couples are heart patients who have come to California to learn what they can do to reduce the risk of having a heart attack. I had to do something because I got where I couldn't work more than like two or three hours a day. I couldn't walk for more than five or 10 minutes without a lot of chest pain. And I had to, I had to do something or I wasn't going to make it. I was overweight. I was um, just dysfunctional. I was disgusted with my life. I was mad at myself. I was mad at the whole world. I screamed at Eva all the time. And then we got into the program. And after a retreat like the one we have in this hotel here, I started to feel better. All of a sudden, I didn't have these tremendous head, uh, chest pain. All of a sudden, I had hope again. Perhaps I can get out of this mess I am in. It's a growing trend in American medicine today. More and more patients and doctors are looking at the power of the mind to heal the body. Medical researchers are studying the effects of stress on patients with life-threatening illnesses, such as heart disease and cancer. They're finding that the more patients relax, the better their overall health. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the work of Dr. Dean Ornish, founder of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute outside of San Francisco. Ornish received international media attention three years ago when he first published findings showing that stress management could actually reverse the course of heart disease. Stress can make your arteries constrict. It can make your blood clot faster, which can clog up the artery. It can make the plaque build up in the arteries faster. We know those mechanisms. We know what happens. We know why those begin to happen. What we're beginning to find, though, is that we can use the mind to heal as well as to harm. That instead of just, and, it, and there's a double benefit, you stop the negative mind-body interactions, but you can also begin to use the mind in ways that are more healing rather than ones that are harmful. And so we're, being, we're able to demonstrate that people not only feel better, but they really are better in ways we can measure. You know, verbatim, if you can. Well, I just think it's ridiculous to uh, move that wall. Dr. Ornish is conducting a session on how to communicate better and avoid stress. A couple has volunteered to act out a domestic quarrel about the remodeling of their kitchen. Whether she's really going to get that much out of the kitchen. When someone says to me, that's a lot of nonsense and a crazy, ridiculous idea. I generally don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get the other the one-week session for heart patients at the Institute costs $5,500. Conventional treatment for severely clogged arteries runs anywhere from $15,000 
to $40,000. Mutual of Omaha, the first major insurance carrier to cover the cost of these sessions, estimates they save six and a half dollars for every one dollar they spend. And I do love her very much. For many of Ornish's patients, this is a last ditch effort. A year and a half ago, I had a uh, heart attack and angioplasty, and uh, it's very clear that unless uh, I do something different than before, I'll have another one, and then another one. And uh, as we, uh, Wallace and I have talked together, it means that uh, we have a choice, and that is that we make some major changes in our lifestyle, or uh, this will happen again. Dr. Ornish's program is decidedly low-tech. No surgery, no drugs, just exercise, meditation, group therapy, and a strict diet. In his groundbreaking study, Ornish found that 80% of those who followed his program were able to reverse their heart disease. The Ornish method heals, but it requires discipline. All the equipment that you have will be perfectly fine. There are a couple words you're probably going to banish from your vocabulary. The first word that goes is saute or fry. That's a word you don't know. Dr. Ornish has hired a French chef to demonstrate to his patients that it's possible to make low-fat foods delicious. We're trying to make food so that people will feel comfortable with what they are eating. It's not giving them tofu or things which are not very organic that may shock them. For example, today we have regional American cuisine. It's hamburgers. It's the classic American meal. They are made from soybeans, and then we have the bread, the rolls are made from wheat germ, and between the beans and the wheat germ, we already have a complete protein. But when patients go home, they say it's hard to kick their old habits. Yesterday I went through a period of depression as I saw exactly what the price would be that I'd have to pay, but it boils down to what kind of a life I want to live, you know, in the many years of my life. And, uh, I have a choice to make. And, uh, and from listening to the people today, it sounds like that they feel like they have a better life than before. Better life. And we want that for ourselves. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to. The idea that diet and lifestyle and smoking and intimacy play a role in health and illness is not a new one. What's new is that we've combined all of that and we're using very strict scientific methods and very high-tech measurements to demonstrate how powerful these ideas can be. New research is changing the way the American medical community views the mind-body connection. Historically, the immune system was believed to be completely independent, an autonomous system that could regulate itself, didn't need input from the brain or any other system. Now we know, or are beginning to believe, that that's in fact not the case, that the brain regulates and influences the immune system, just like it regulates and influences most of the other systems in the body, and that in fact the immune system can be very much influenced by the brain. Scientists believe this communication between the brain and the immune system comes from a chain reaction. When in a state of stress, the hypothalamus, the brain's hormonal clock, sends a signal to the pituitary gland. Hormonal excess can change the functioning of the immune system. Today, a new science, psychoneuroimmunology, studies this interaction. It's a pretty new area, and we don't know very much yet. We don't know too much about that, but there's some suggestive evidence that interventions, relaxation, um, cognitive interventions, where people learn how to problem solve better, or emotional expression interventions, where people allow themselves to experience emotions in a supportive environment. Those kinds of approaches are showing, have been shown to have some impact on the immune system. Researchers studying breast cancer, a disease that affects one in eight American women in their lifetime, are also studying the mind-body connection. Sandy's cancer was discovered three years ago. The doctors gave her two years to live. I felt very lonely. I had no one to compare things with. 
I had friends who had breast cancer, but nobody who had it metastasized. Not only was I happy to get in the group because I really wanted to talk to other women. I wanted to know what they were going through, and it was great. It was almost instant bonding. Sandy is part of a study in which one group gets conventional medical treatment for breast cancer, while women in the other group also attend group therapy sessions. I think people who don't have cancer look at someone who does have cancer and they expect to see something different than they see. I think it's the issue uh, that you have it, but you're dealing with it. They meet every week to talk about their illness and to learn how to accept death. The sessions are filmed and later analyzed. Four years after the study started, all of the women who received only medical treatment are dead. But one third of the women in the therapy group, including Sandy, are still alive. I don't want to talk about it. It's not about And you can hardly wait. Yeah, There are a number of studies that show that social support modifies the way we respond, for example, to stressful situations. That uh, uh, if an animal is stressed, it releases cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid stress hormone that mobilizes blood sugar and allows you to respond to the stressor. Uh, but there are studies that show that if you put an animal in the same stressing, stressful situation and he has one of his friends with him, you only get half the increase in cortisol. And if he has five of his friends with him, you get no increase at all. So one, one way to think of social support is that it's a kind of a stress buffer. For example, breast cancer is a hormone-sensitive tumor. And so if you can alter the rate at which your body produces cortisol in response to stress, you may be shifting that internal environment so that the body doesn't encourage tumor growth as much. He didn't tell me what it was when he visited her. So Today, Sandy wants to talk about her upcoming move. The new house could be her last one. Talking with the other patients is the first step in overcoming her anxiety about the move. I feel that it's unfair that I have to um, be in this position right now. Mm -hmm. Because I've always, I've always been a good girl. Why do, why do I have to end up like that? Mm -hmm. Why can't I just be comfortable? I never think about the fact that because I'm meeting with these women, I might live longer. I think about it making me feel good and making my time here better. As I reflect on my mortality, I want to fight even harder to stay alive. And I also want to work on accepting my death. In uh, modern medicine, we have become so intoxicated with technology. We have now developed a model that is more a disease cure than a health care model, where our focus is really on acting as though we were curing all diseases, when in fact, the illnesses in the West that kill most people are chronic, progressive, and largely incurable diseases, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. And so what we're really doing is helping people live as well as they can, as long as they can, with a serious illness. None of the recent advances in research are cures. At best, patients might live a little longer and be happier. But as scientists learn more about the human mind and its power, patients with life-threatening diseases are immersing themselves, body and soul, into their own medical care. <laughs>